Okay. Um, so welcome on behalf of the Goldstone Caregiver Center and Faith Community Nurse Program. I welcome all of you to today's presentation. I'd like to introduce to you our presenters today, Danbury attorneys, Tom and Michelle Murphy. They are elder law, estate planning and probate attorneys serving the Danbury area for over 58 years combined. Attorney Thomas Murphy uh, received his bachelor of science in economics from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, followed by a career in corporate management he then graduated cum laude from Pace University School of Law. He's a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, as well as the Elder Law Section and the Estates and Probate Section of the Connecticut Bar Association. Tom is an accredited attorney with Veterans Affairs. Attorney Michelle Murphy, who's an RN and MSN, earned her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Pennsylvania, and her Master of Science in Nursing from Yale University. She practiced as a newborn ICU nurse at Yale New Haven uh, Hospital and Danbury Hospital, and as a community health nurse in Western Connecticut. Michelle earned her Juris Doctor from Pace University School of Law and has been practicing elder law, estate planning, and probate law ever since, including advocacy for the rights of mentally and physically disabled persons from the probate courts to the Connecticut Supreme Court. Michelle also is an accredited attorney with Veterans Affairs. During our next hour together, you will discover how Tom and Michelle have uniquely merged their educational and career experiences in business and nursing by applying a holistic problem-solving approach to elder law and estate planning issues. Their approach has enabled them to provide comprehensive assessments and plans individually tailored to meet their clients' needs. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom and Michelle. Thank you all for being here today. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Miranda. We feel very honored and thrilled to actually, we wish we were at Goldstone right now, but we feel very thrilled to be able to have you folks join us. This afternoon, we appreciate you taking the time, whether it's your lunch hour or just taking time out of your day to spend the next hour with us. And uh, I hope you got a little sense that Tom and I do have a somewhat unusual background ending up as attorneys. Uh, and we're very proud of taking that situation of Tom being a businessman and me being in nursing and merging that in offering very individualized assessment and plan of care. So, with everything that you just heard about us, we wanna talk more about what your needs are. And I think that the main issue that we see often with what people have come to see us, what we hear is that people are very, very concerned about maintaining their independence and protecting their resources and their lifestyle. And we often tell people, please don't listen to what your neighbor says. Please don't listen to a family member who may think they know all of what it is you want and what you need. We encourage people to think about what their goals and needs are as you age and what is it that you want to accomplish, whether it's staying at home or looking for socialization in an assisted living setting or a congregate setting. These are all very individualized needs and Everyone's concerned about balancing those needs and goals with people's resources. That's the inevitable. And why is that? Everyone knows that the cost of long-term care is very, very, or can be very, very expensive. And so because of that, you have conflicting issues of what you need, what you want, how you're gonna afford it. And that leads us to our today's program, which we say is, how do we help you protect your life savings and your lifestyle? Well, that can get accomplished in several ways and we're gonna talk about that this afternoon. Uh, one thing I should just ask is, does everyone have the outline that was provided? It will help you somewhat follow along some of the things that Tom and I are going to talk about this afternoon. If not, please check an attachment that Miranda would have sent 
with um, your invite uh, to this program. We like to talk about elder law strategies as being a comprehensive way to empower senior persons to afford the cost of long-term care for as long as possible. Why is that important? Because we want to help you leverage your private resources with things like Medicaid and VA if you're a veteran's benefits. By using things like trusts, annuities, and other techniques, you can avoid running out of funds and protect your lifestyle along the way. And why is that important? Because once again, you as individuals, all of you who are joining us today, have needs that are not the same as anyone else. So we hope that, um, that you'll learn some, some tips and techniques that might help you in your decision-making. And that's really what this is all about. Uh, and that's what Goldstone and the Community Nurse Program is, having you know your options and feeling empowered and enabling yourself to make an option that's right for your needs. One of the first topics we're gonna to talk about today is Medicaid. Now, just to do a little housekeeping, Medicaid is not Medicare. The reason I distinguish that is people often confuse the two. Medicare is a program that's administered through the federal government, specifically with Social Security, and it is an acute program of health insurance coverage. It is not going to cover the cost of long-term care more than in a very small amount of time. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you have, for example, a hospitalization at Danbury Hospital where you've had a surgery and you need rehabilitation, you can go to a nursing home, a skilled nursing home, or get skilled nursing care at home where the Medicare coverage will cover at a nursing home up to 100 days. That is different than Medicaid. And the reason we distinguish that is we're not going to talk about Medicare today. We're talking about how to plan and protect your lifestyle and life savings which you need a funding source for that. And that is where Medicaid comes in. Tom in a second is gonna to talk to you about the criteria for Medicaid, the eligibility, but Medicaid is also administered by the Department of Social Service in the state of Connecticut. You might heard of DSS, uh, but once again, it is not Medicare. It's also known as Title 19. These are all terms that you've probably heard. Just so you can clarify in your mind that we're not talking about the Medicare benefit that you get when you go to the doctor or go to the hospital. It's Medicaid, Title 19, administered by DSS or the Department of Social Service. So Tom's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the criteria and then we're gonna help you uh, kind of work through some different examples that we've had in our office to better illustrate how Medicaid works and feels. So you get the basic idea. If you're confronting a long-term care situation or a loved one is, or you're even concerned that someday you might, the last thing you wanna do is burn through your life savings and financially paint yourself into a nursing home. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to preserve choices, range of options, lifestyle options in particular. And to do that, you need to preserve a funding source to sustain the lifestyle that you most prefer. And um, the number one way to do that is by uh, leveraging your resources with other resources that are out there. The Medicaid program 19 is a huge potential resource uh, for paying for long-term care. And therefore you're gonna wanna know what it provides and how it treats your assets and your income so that you can plan uh, your way toward preserving your options by qualifying for that program if the need to do so arises or even potentially may arise. So uh, what is Medicaid and what does it cover? It's a joint federal state program that uh, between the two pays for long-term care in various forms. It pays for nursing home care, which most people know. You contribute your income, uh, plus or minus, we'll get into that, and Medicaid will pay the rest. Uh, most people don't know that Medicaid also has a very generous home care benefit. Medicaid can pay for home care up to and including a live-in caregiver. And so you don't need to move into a nursing home to receive Medicaid benefits to help pay for your care. It also provides uh, what's called the assisted living pilot program that pays a portion of assisted living. 
And so that also can, can help uh, supplement your resources to enable you to afford your ability to either stay at home with home care much longer or even pay for assisted living much longer and therefore retain your, 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 your preferred uh, setting for the care that you want um, and, and put off uh, into the future, hopefully, or, or, or never needing it at all, um, a rather involuntary admission to a nursing home uh, simply because you've run out of funds. That's what we're hoping to avoid. To qualify for Medicaid, uh, the state will look at all of your assets and your income. Your house is exempt if either you or your spouse are living in it. <clears throat> so that raises the question, well, what happens if someday, let's say, either you or your spouse has passed away and the other one of you moves into a nursing home, uh, then the house is no longer exempt, uh, which means you have to sell it and burn through the proceeds. And so some people will incorporate the value of the house into their planning, um, even if it's a currently exempt asset, because currently exempt assets have a funny way of becoming not exempt uh, later in the future. Also, even if you live in the house for your entire lifetime and the house is exempt for the duration, then upon your death, when your children go to probate your estate, which would include your house, uh, then the state of Connecticut has a priority claim against your estate and they will get repaid. Uh, so it, it, it bears including the house into your uh, plan. Other than that, I think as most people know, you have to be pretty close to broke to qualify for Medicaid. They'll allow you to have $1,600 in assets. I have the numbers here in the outline if you want the exact numbers. Uh, but, but everything else pretty much has to be depleted except for the house and the 1600. You're allowed to have a vehicle, a prepaid funeral, but as you can see, by and large, your assets can be uh, depleted before you can qualify for the program if you don't plan in advance. If you're married and you're in a nursing home, then the uh, state will exempt for your spouse one half of your liquid assets up to $130,000 max. So if you're married and you have $200,000, your spouse gets to keep half, 100 grand. But if you're married and you have 500,000, then your spouse gets to keep half, but only up to the cap of 130. So he or she will only get 130. And as far as income goes, if you are living at home, uh, there is an income cap to the Medicaid home care program. It's around $2,300 a month. We'll talk about what you can do if you're over that. Uh, your spouse's income is off the table if you're at home. If you're in a nursing home, your spouse's income is still off the table, but yours will go partially to the nursing home and partially to the spouse, depending on some calculations that we have to run. So as you can see, uh, Medicaid qualification requires some very precise um, uh, eligibility criteria that have to be met. And therefore the planning for meeting those criteria has to be very, very precise. Uh, but what I can tell you is that the further in advance that you start, the more you can protect. But even if you are already in a long-term care situation, you can still protect more than you would have thought. Okay. Good to know. We have this question, but we've seen this asked a lot. And our client, Dorothy, had this question to us. She was very interested in protecting her resources from Medicaid. But her biggest concern was, if I go on Medicaid, am I gonna be limited by the doctors that I can choose, the hospital I go to, if I need a nursing home for rehab or long-term, will I have different care? Was there any concern? What were Dorothy's concerns warranted? Not really. If you, Medicaid, you don't give up Medicare. And so Medicare will still be your primary insurance. So if you go to the doctor or the hospital or receive any other type of care that used to be covered by Medicare, it still will be covered by Medicare. Medicaid becomes your 
secondary insurance or if you if you already have a Medicare supplement, that will remain in place and Medicaid will become your tertiary form of insurance. Um, and if you are if you are looking to have home care and you're on Medicaid, there are plenty of home care agencies in the area that take both private pay and Medicaid. And so you'll be able to shop around for a good caregiver. Um, in fact, if you are on private pay with a home care agency today and you transition onto Medicaid tomorrow, they're not gonna pull your aid out of the house and deliver a new one. Uh, you're gonna have the same aid. And uh, so, some of our greatest home care success stories with our clients have been with caregivers who were paid by Medicaid. Because uh, as you know, having home care is such a personal thing that uh, the key factor is the fit between the uh, elder and the caregiver, um, which, which can be uh, very personal in nature anyway. And if you're in a nursing home uh, and you're on private pay and then you switch over to Medicaid, they're not gonna wheel you down to their Medicaid basement wing because they don't have one. The beds are fungible. You will stay where you are. All the nursing homes in the area take Medicaid to begin with. So there's no issue with that. Um, and if you are on Medicaid or private pay in a nursing home, no one who's taking care of you knows who's paying the bill. The people who come into your room will treat you just the same. You're gonna eat the same food in the same dining room. And so, no, it's a, as you walk through a nursing home, you can't tell who's private pay and who's Medicaid. So the bottom line is it doesn't limit the choices and options that you have. And like Tom said, you don't really, uh, the person who's taking care of you has no idea what your payment source is. Uh, so you're gonna get the same care if you are on Medicare, Medicaid, or privately paying or long-term care insurance covering your bill. And that's an important fact because of the fear that what happens to me on Medicaid. I'd like to introduce you to our clients, Ted and Audrey. This is a very common scenario when we meet with people. Uh, Ted had uh, some home care that they were paying for out of pocket. They were not having um, needs that were to the extent of someone living there yet, but it was home care that was every day and quite a few hours. So it was costing quite a bit for mm -hmm. the call. Um, when they did contact us, their biggest concern was if they spend down to be able to qualify for Medicaid because Ted was having increasing needs and he needed uh, more and more home care to the point where he actually eventually did need someone to live with them and take care of him. The concern was, what's gonna be left for Audrey? And a lot of couples are concerned because in a couple situation, people where they're married and, and no one's health remains the same together, everyone ages differently. And so that's a common question that the spouse who is fine and stable, what happens to me? What's gonna happen to our finances? Mm -hmm. So the first thing we look at for a married couple is the ability to shield half the assets for the healthy spouse. And, and the question is half the assets as of when? Because when we met Ted and Audrey, they had about 50 grand left. So, okay, does that mean Audrey can only keep 25 grand as we apply for Medicaid for Ted? Well, if they don't know the rules, yeah, that's what it means. But what we can do and what we do is establish the so-called date of institutionalization, which is one of those magic Medicaid terms. Sounds so harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> um, which basically certifies when the Medicaid applicant needed long-term care. And that can either be when the person actually is institutionalized or when he became functionally institutionalized by needing assistance with his activities of daily living, his ADFs. So we were able to fix a date on the calendar a year prior when Ted started needing assistance with his ADLs. Well, lo and behold, back then, their assets were around 100 grand. They had spent down 50 grand on home care. 
So by establishing that date a year ago as his DO, date of institutionalization, DOI, retroactively, we're, we were able to establish their assets uh, for the two of them at 100 grand, which means Audrey was able to keep 50. Coincidentally, they had already spent down to 50, which meant, bingo, Ted was eligible for Medicaid today, and Audrey was able to keep the full 50. And that was well-timed because Works as I every mentioned, time. Ted's needs were increasing and they were at the point where living really was making sense. One thing about Medicaid is that the, the eligibility rules are very, very specific, which sometimes works in the state's advantage. If you're off by a dime, you're, you're out rather than in. And so you, you need to make sure you're not off by a dime. But if you're not off by a dime, if you really comply with the rules, then the good news is the state can't bend them in their favor either. So one we've satisfied uh, the criteria for a particular rule or, or treatment of something, then we can be confident that, that that's going to go to the bank. Uh, the state won't be able to uh, twist it in their favor. So as we were talking about people who have too much money to qualify, meaning over asset, uh, that brings up um, our client, Ron. Now, Ron, he needed home care. He had more money than the $1,600 threshold that Tom mentioned earlier for criteria. But his money, he thought based on the current home care needs that he had, were only going to cover maybe about two years. So how did you help Ron qualify for Medicaid so that he would be able to have that coverage for home care? So we just looked at a situation where we were able to simply reclassify things on paper without having to spend down anything further. Once we've done that, or if we're not able to do that, we next look at how can the exposed assets be dealt with? Uh, and there's kind of a, a hierarchy for that. And, and the first thing we look at is what you might think of as the low hanging fruit. What's easy to do? And here we're talking about just a targeted spend down. If someone has not much ex excess assets, then this alone can do the trick. Even if somebody has a lot of excess assets, this usually is the, the cream on the top that we, that we uh, whittle down uh, before we get down into the harder strategies. Uh, again, because it's easy and, and it's usually very beneficial. And all we're talking about is spending money on things that Ron was gonna have to spend money on someday anyway, or things that benefited him enough that he considered it to be worthwhile. The house is an exempt asset. If you have a mortgage, you can pay it down or pay it off. You can make repairs, improvements. You can put on an addition, you can put in a pool, you can put in a jacuzzi, you can do whatever you want <laughs> because it's an exempt asset. Uh, so that's a good place to, uh, to, to uh, either bury or invest funds, depending on how you look at it. Uh, the mortgage is gonna be paid someday anyway, so why not put the cost onto the state? Uh, the next is a motor vehicle. Uh, Ron was allowed to have one shiny new car of, of any kind. And so he traded in his 15 year old Buick LeSabre uh, and, and bought himself a Lexus. And, and then he had something that would serve him uh, well for many years. Uh, you can buy a prepaid funeral contract, not the most exciting way to spend money, but you're gonna pay for a funeral someday anyway. So you might as well escrow it effectively at the expense of the state on your way to qualifying for Medicaid benefits. So there are ways that, that people can, um, can spend money uh, on things that they're gonna have to spend money on anyway, prepaying taxes, buying new clothes, lifetime supply of incontinence products, lifetime supply of Doritos. Uh, it, remember that when the time <laughs> comes. Um, you know, the list is whatever you want it to be. As long as it's benefiting what you need. And I'm not really sure where the Doritos comes in, but- We'll talk about that. Later. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you all get the idea that uh, there are ways in which a straightforward spend down can benefit you and enable you to qualify as soon as possible for the funding from uh, DSS as needed. Our client, Mary, had about $200,000 when we met her, and she was starting to get home care. The question that she asked, 
the question her daughters asked us is the question that probably all of you have. And that is, does she have to wait five years if she transfers the $200,000 to her daughters to apply for the Medicaid benefit? So in addition to being below the asset limit and the income limit, when you apply for Medicaid, it also has to be true that you haven't transferred any assets within the last five years of your Medicaid application, the so-called look back period. So if you're Bill Gates, you can transfer all your assets to your kids or to a trust today, wait five years and then qualify for Medicaid. Uh, but if you're not Bill Gates and you only have $200,000 and you're amenable to qualifying yourself by transferring assets, uh, then do you still have to wait five years? Because what if that 200 grand isn't enough to cover you for the next five years? Maybe you've already started needing some level of assistance with your ADLs. You're already spending some money on home care. 200 grand isn't gonna get you five years. And so does that mean you're gonna end up in a nursing home because you're gonna get caught short? And the answer is no. Uh, if you do apply for Medicaid within five years, then the state will see that transfer so in Mary's case, if she put 200 grand either in her kids' names or a trust, and we'll, we'll talk later about which of those uh, to do, then the state will see that. And, and most people think that if the state sees it, that they'll disqualify you for five years. That is not the case. They will disqualify you for a penalty period, but the penalty period is calculated based on the amount of money you gave away. It's one month for every $13,500 that you transferred. I'm using rough numbers. So it's about seven months for every 100,000. So in Mary's case, she could protect the entire 200,000 by transferring it today, applying for Medicaid immediately to show them that she had done it and thereby forcing the state to commence her penalty period but the penalty period would only be 14 months in duration. So during the 14 months, her kids would pay for whatever home care she needed out of the 200 grand, which in her case wasn't all that much. So at the end of the 14 months, most of that 200 grand was left and she was eligible for Medicaid. And thereafter, she was able to use the Medicaid home care program to pay for the home care she needed and preserve the 200 grand or most of it to supplement what Medicaid would pay for. So if she ever got to the point where she needed more home care than Medicaid would provide, she would be able to pay for only the portion that Medicaid would not provide. And so instead of her assets depleting on a sharp line and her entering a nursing home when it was gone, by supplementing it with state benefits, she was able to deplete her assets on a very, very gradual line, in which case her assets lasted far, far longer and thereby extending her ability to stay at home for an additional period of years. And in that case, that was a very good result. And so one of the key issues is when you hear about the look back period regarding transfer of assets, we often hear people say, oh, I can't do anything for five years. And just to reiterate what Tom said, and that is, it depends on the amount of the transfer. And so, as you can see, if somebody is either needing home care, very little, or even if you need a lot, we'll, we'll get into a situation that we'll talk about that in a minute, but for someone who is in planning mode, if you do it sooner than later, you can see how that plan works the best. And so for Mary's situation, her not needing much home care and not needing it much during the penalty period was beneficial because it preserved the money to be available for other things that she would like. And that's where, as remember we're talking about, how are we helping you consider your options to protect your lifestyle and your life savings? That's one way in which mm -hmm. your lifestyle can be managed because if your goal is to stay at home and age in place, and that's one powerful way to do so. And so sooner is better than later. But that doesn't mean you don't have options. And we're going to get into a couple of situations, which leads me to share with you our client, Barbara. Now, Barbara 
uh, had uh, extensive needs that required her to unfortunately go, and I say unfortunately because most people want to stay at home if they can, unfortunately go to a nursing home because she needed to have nursing care for her limitations of mobility and, and, other, um, and other related issues. So her question when she came, well, we actually came to see her hmm. pre-COVID, uh, was that I'm already in a nursing home. This costs fourteen to $16,000 a month. I'm coming off of Medicare. If I transfer my assets, I'm in a nursing home. I don't know if I'll be able to go home. How will I, and, and all of my assets are now being consumed, needing to pay for that. How can I do anything during the penalty period? So the question really is, we talked about transferring assets. Here she is in a very costly situation. How will I have anything left if I'm consuming mm -hmm. all of my assets, paying for my care? And it is an average of fourteen to sixteen thousand dollars a month in a nursing home in the local area. It'll all be gone anyway. So, why was there any way around this? Is there any way to be able to reconcile um, putting money into um, being transferred and then needing to find a way for a payment source? Basic rule of thumb is if two lawyers are talking about it, there's a way around it. So a minute ago, we saw how someone could protect most of her remaining $200,000 because during the 14 month penalty period, she didn't have to spend much of it on her home care. But if you're already in a nursing home, you do have to spend most of it on your care. If the penalty period uh, divisor is $13,500 uh, uh, per month or one month per $13,500, home costs $15,000 a month and you give 200 grand to the kids, aren't they going to have to give back the whole 200 to pay for 14 months worth of nursing home care? And the answer is yes. So how do you get around that? We take the 200 and we use a little algebra to calculate two things simultaneously, each of which is dependent. We, we divide the money into two shares. Uh, and just to make the math easy, I'll use 100 and 100. We, we take 100,000 and transfer that to the kids, which will result in a penalty period of seven months. And we take the other 100,000 and use that to purchase an irrevocable annuity, which is structured to pay out over seven months at the rate of $13,500 per month. So now uh, uh, Barbara was eligible for Medicaid at the very beginning in month one, except for the, the transfer of assets, which means that the state would commence her penalty period on day one, it would run for 7,000 because she had gotten all the money out of her name, either by the transferring of 100 or the putting the other 100 into an irrevocable annuity. Both are allowed on, under Medicaid law within the calculations we're talking about. So she had a seven month penalty period the annuity paid for her care during the seven months. Think of two lines converging. The annuity ran out when the penalty period ran out. And so at that cutoff, she was eligible for Medicaid, having protected 50% of what she started with, $100,000. It sounds like a win-win situation. And most of our clients do exactly, the two scenarios that we've just discussed are what most of our clients do. And, and the myth is that once you do start needing care, a lot of people are afraid to then consider their options because they think it's simply too late. And so mm -hmm. with understanding what the five-year look back period means, how it's applied and how you can take one asset and put it into another, like an irrevocable annuity, which mm -hmm. is Medicaid compliant, enables you to salvage some of the assets, perhaps not all of them, but it's still very powerful, once again, mm -hmm. to enable you to have funds available to maintain your lifestyle and protect some of your life savings. So that's, that's a, a pretty powerful mm -hmm. uh, option and what have you. Our client, Anna, she was all set. She wanted to protect her assets. There was no concern on her part about doing so. Um, you know, she, she wasn't needy yet, she was starting to, to 
need some help from her family, but she wasn't really in anything more than a planning mode, which perhaps a lot of you today are in that mindset of what can I do? Um, I've had a loved one who needed a lot of care and it exhausted all of their funds and it really limited their options. So their lifestyle became impacted. But Anna's situation was a little, um, I thought it was kind of neat because I think that's sort of the trend that we're seeing now, which is people really do want to plan ahead. She understood the five-year look back period, but her concern was she was afraid to give her resources, her assets outright to her children. Why would that be? It's not that she didn't have a good relationship with her children. It's that she understood that life is uncertain, that life happens, things happen. People have unfortunate things happen to their lives that are not planned and not predicted. And that was her concern with what would happen if she gave money outright to her children. So what was the solution for Anna? What gave her peace of mind? So if you put money or your house in your children's names, and a lot of people used to just do that, they would say, I know, to protect my house from Medicaid, I'm just gonna sign one of those quick claim deeds and put it in the kids' names, easy squeezy. Sure, until one of your kids has a problem, like a divorce or a lawsuit, or their own medical problem, or a loss of job, or maybe they're filling out financial aid applications for their kids to go to college, and they have to report the money that they're sitting on for you, and it prevents them from getting financial aid, and now they have a problem with their husband or wife, and uh, yuck. So, so what we've seen in more recent years, overwhelmingly, the, the people who are looking to protect assets from Medicaid, uh, through transfers of assets rather than spend down or, or whatever, do so with the use of a trust. In this case, it's an irrevocable trust. You either have or know people who have revocable trusts, revocable living trusts, which are great tools for avoiding probate. We write them all the time for people who are trying to avoid probate but they don't protect assets from Medicaid or anybody else because they're revocable. If you wanna protect assets from Medicaid and avoid probate, you can do so through an irrevocable trust. And if you do, then you've gotten the property out of whether it's house or bank accounts or mutual funds or whatever, we'll just call it the property. You put that in the trust and uh, that means you don't own it it also means the kids don't own it. And so it's protected with regard to your Medicaid and it's protected with regard to the kids' creditors. So no matter what happens to the kids, their creditors can't burst that little bubble between you and your kids. Works like a charm. And in the end, it also avoids probate, which saves the kids the hassle at the time of your death. So, so how does it work? The trust is irrevocable, so you can't just cancel it. The trust also has to say that distributions back to you directly are not allowed. That's what protects it from the state. If you can't get it, they can't get it. And so what if you want it back? What if you want money back from the trust? What do you do? Well, the trust has a back door in it that allows distributions to your kids, or it could be grandkids or nieces or nephews, depending on your family dynamics, but let's just call them kids. So you need 25 grand back from the trust because you want a car or make some house repairs or whatever. And your son is the trustee. Uh, he can cut a check from the trust to himself or to any of your other kids. They put it in their account overnight and then write a check. We'll talk about taxes in a minute. Uh, and so by doing that, access to the money that you've put in the trust. And just for added measure, the trust allows you to remove a trustee. So if your son is the trustee and he's not being cooperative with what you want, you can simply remove him as trustee and go on to your next choice for trustee. Uh, and my favorite is that the one thing about it that you can change for the rest of your life is the final distribution upon your death. And so if your son is thinking of going against your wishes, he'll know that he's running the risk of you disinheriting him in the end. So you can guess how often that happens. 
We've never seen that. No, no. Uh, and during your lifetime, you hold a veto over any distributions. So you can ask for distributions, uh, but your a son, again, if he's a trustee, he can't simply make distributions because he wants to take your money. Uh, any intended distributions have to be noticed to you in writing 10 days in advance, and you can veto it. So you have control over what you put in the trust, uh, even though you've gotten it out of your name for Medicaid purposes. And for that reason, uh, they have become incredibly popular. I would say of the people who are interested in protecting their assets through transfers, probably something like 99% of them do so through the trust, just because it provides all of those benefits. Right. Now, of course, Anna's concern was related to um, not giving her children any money outright because of concern of life being uncertain for her children and not knowing if and when something might happen. And then they have these assets of hers and she needs them and, and so on and so on. Anna also raised another concern, which some of you may be thinking about. So Anna had a house and she had stocks. Now for her, if she transferred the house and stocks, her children would have capital gain consequences if, um, if they sold those assets after her death. And so, you know, that's, that's not insignificant. And I'm sure that you folks have thought about the taxation issues as well. And Tom had mentioned addressing that. So what would the solution be for Anna having those concerns in addition to the other concerns that she voiced? Mm -hmm. There are three taxes you want to think about, capital gains, income, and gift tax. With regard to capital gains taxes, if Anna had died before doing any of this, her appreciated assets, her stocks and her house, would have passed to her children through her estate and received a step up in cost basis so that when her children sold the assets, they wouldn't pay any uh, capital gains tax on her lifetime gain. Uh, but if she put those assets into her children's names directly without a trust, she also would have given her children her cost basis so that upon her death, there would be no step up and there would be capital gains tax to be paid by the kids. But by putting the assets into the trust that we're talking about, it's written as a so-called grantor trust, which has very special significance under the Internal Revenue Code it means that even though the trust assets are out of Anna's name for Medicaid purposes, they're still considered hers for tax purposes. That may sound bad, but it's actually very good because that means that upon her death, those assets do pass to the kids with a stepped up basis so that the kids don't have to pay capital gains tax. It also means that any income on the trust assets, if there's a mutual fund or a rental property or anything else, even just a CD, in the trust, any interests or dividends or rents or anything else that come from those assets end up on Anna's 1040, same as they would if she still owned those assets. So the, the income is not being taxed to the kids and it's not being taxed to the trust. Thank God, because trust income tax rates are brutal. So you want that income on, on Anna's 1040 where it always was, because that's the best deal she could get. And third, gift taxes. Because it's a grantor trust, whatever gift she makes from herself to the trust is not considered a reportable gift because the property is still hers for tax purposes. It's like she gave it to herself. Only when a distribution is made from the trust to the kids and then from the kids back to Anna, only then is a gift completed and, and reportable. Uh, but then again, only if it exceeds $15,000 per person per year. And even then, if it does, it has to be reported, okay, you gotta file a gift tax return, but that's easy. Each of us has a $7.1 million lifetime gift tax exclusion. So even if you have a reportable gift, it's not gonna be taxable. So you might have to file a return, but you won't be writing a check. So one thing just to add, 
we're more briefly talking about the use of irrevocable trusts today in terms of how to apply that to uh, asset protection, you know, and protecting your lifestyle and your life savings. We have a few folks, many of you may already have signed up. We have a, another program on April 21st that's going to go a little bit more in depth on trusts. And um, we invite you to join us if you haven't signed up and you can do it the same way that you signed up for today's program. So I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to mention that because if you have questions about trust, we encourage you to join us in a couple of weeks and, and hope you will. Just, just a, another point on that. The irrevocable trust, if you're trying to protect assets post-crisis, where you need to do this immediately, it can be obviously very effective in preserving whatever percentage of the assets we can calculate. But if you're in planning mode, you can establish the irrevocable trust and then fund it as you please. And so we have lots of people who are younger seniors or, or even people who are approaching retirement age, maybe they'll establish a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust, and they'll sprinkle their assets between the two so that upon their death, one way or another, everything avoids probate. And then over time, they'll take assets from the revocable and they'll add it to the irrevocable so that the amount that they're protecting over time increases. And so you, you can establish a trust today and then feed it whatever you want Good point, yeah, for sure. We've talked about things like five-year look-back period. We've talked about uh, ways in which people can reduce their assets to make them eligible sooner, especially if they need home care. There are situations, and, and uh, our client Bernard gives um, an example as to how it is he was over asset, meaning he had more than $1,600, and was able to qualify for Medicaid. Now, Bernard, he lived with his son for several years, and then Bernard decided he really wanted social with his um, age group and chose to move into assisted living. So during those few years where he still needed care and the son was helping him out, and then he ended up moving into assisted living, did Bernard have to wait five years to apply if he transferred his assets sometime during those few years. I think it was actually right before he moved into assisted mm -hmm. living that he transferred his assets to uh, his son. Would Bernard have to wait the five year look back like we had talked about? There are three gaping exceptions to the five year look back period. One is if you have a disabled child, you can transfer whatever you want to that child and no Medicaid look back, no Medicaid penalty. If you have an asset that's exempt to begin with, but, but not including the house. So let's say you have a car. You can gift that car to one of your children as part of your last minute Medicaid planning activities. You can do that on your way to the nursing home if you want. Uh, and number three is if you live with a child uh, or, or a grandchild or any other family member, for two years or longer, and that child takes care of you throughout that time, it doesn't have to be 24 hours a day, but it has to be enough that you couldn't have gotten by without it. And, and if it's really true that you couldn't have gotten by without it for the full two years. <coughs> in other words, if that person effectively kept you out of a nursing home for two years, then you can transfer up to one house and about $300,000 of other assets to that person without me any Medicaid penalty. It's just an exception. Call it incentive <laughs> to take care of your loved ones. Uh, but, but I mean, this walks in the door all the time. At any given time, we have at least a couple of applications pending before the state that are based on this exception alone. And I think that uh, as a result of COVID, we're seeing more and more family members taking care of more and more family members, and that's ringing this bell more and more often. Uh, so just be aware that it's out there. And some people actually plan. We know a lot of people who the children, the adult children live in Connecticut, their parents live in other states, and they actually make a plan where they yeah. have an in-law set up in their home, or they see the loved one is aging and not 
and, and would benefit greatly from being with the adult mm -hmm. child and their family and plan accordingly. And so that's great too, because then from the outset, you can have that plan set up. Right. Um, but as you can imagine, Bernard was quite pleased to find out his son who was just doing it out of love and compassion for his dad was able to have that transfer and be exempt. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now we've been talking up until now all about the assets and Tom had mentioned the asset limit for being eligible for Medicaid. We have people come to us all the time saying, I'm not gonna be eligible for Medicaid. My income is too high. I'm a retired uh, school teacher and my pension is several thousand dollars a month. And if you can remember what Tom had said that you know, if you have more than $2,500, you may not be eligible for home care. Um, that was the case really for, um, for Brian and many others. Mm -hmm. Brian was a longtime school teacher and I believe his income was about $4,500 a month. Now, if that's true and he's at home and he's needing home care, then there have become a whole host of issues of, I need the income because I have to pay my real estate taxes, I own a home, I have to have money available for the upkeep of the house. Um, how am I gonna have home care and all of those expenses covered if my income is too high and I can't apply and be eligible for home care? So is that true that Brian being over income would not be able to be eligible? It is true that he would not be able to be eligible if he was not aware of the way to make himself eligible, but there is a way to make himself eligible. I'm gonna cover sections M and N on the outline together. Uh, so for home care, yes, there's an income limit. And if you're over it, you're out. But there is a way to reduce your countable income without reducing your actual income. And it's known as a pooled trust. It's something that's enabled under federal law. Every state maintains a pooled trust with a not-for-profit entity. In Connecticut, it's called Plan of Connecticut. You can check out their website. And this is what they do. They maintain a trust and people from all over the state subscribe to it. And each month they send plan a check representing their excess income. So if the limit is 2,300 and their income is 3,300, then each month they send plan a check for $1,000. And that reduces their countable income to below the limit and it makes them eligible for the Medicaid home care program. Plan of Connecticut then takes that $1,000 and uses it to pay whatever bills you send them. Any household bills, mortgage, taxes, utilities, home care if you're paying for some of it privately, um, car payment, credit card payment, really any bills that you pay each month, you can send $1,000 worth of them to plan or whatever your relevant amount is and they'll pay the bills for you. So you're effectively giving them the income and having them give it right back to you. It's like money laundering, but legal. <laughs> and, and, and it works every time. It's, it's, it's kind of silly that the state makes you do this if it works every time, what's the point? Um, but that is the rule. Uh, and, and the good news is that it does work. So don't ever let anybody tell you that you have too much income for a Medicaid home care program because you probably don't. Uh, and, and the other is if you're in a nursing home, if you're single, your income will go to the nursing home, except for a couple of small deductions. If you're married and you have a spouse in the house for you, Dr. Seuss fans, then uh, he or she can keep his or her income and you can give your spouse some of your income as well, depending on some calculations we'd have to run and then give only the difference to the nursing home. So there again, if you're married and you're in a nursing home, don't let the nursing home tell you that you have to give them all of your income because you may very well not have to. And so it just has to be studied on a case by case basis to see what your numbers are. And that's of course a concern for someone who's at home and needs extra money to be able to afford staying home. Once again, back to how do we help you sustain your lifestyle as you're aging? Now, Tom had mentioned how we help where income is too high and, um, and we've talked about the assets. But you may have this question now, what about someone who, if you remember our client, Donald, we were talking about, he needed home care, 
He knew his house was exempt because he was staying at home. So what did he do? He put all of his liquid assets into that irrevocable trust that was established. But then his concern was, I'll be eligible for Medicaid because I'll qualify being below $1,600, but will my house remain fully protected because it's not in the trust? Mm. No, it'll remain fully protected while he's alive and living in it. But if he later enters a nursing home, then it's back on the table. Uh, and even if he stays home, then upon his death, when the house gets probated, the state will file a priority claim in probate court to recover every dime they've paid out for him for any form of assistance they've given him. And so for that reason, a lot of people will include the house in their planning, even if it's currently exempt. And so if they're planning on engaging in transfers, maybe they're gonna do the irrevocable trust, and they only have a hundred grand in cash, they might think, I only need to deal with my hundred grand in cash. I'll have a seven month period, no big deal. Uh, but if that leaves the house, then they might choose to push it a bit by also including the house uh, in the planning, putting that in the trust. And maybe that extends the penalty period by a year, depending on the value of the house. Um, but uh, maybe it's worth it if the cost of care is low uh, presently. And, and so by waiting a little longer to, uh, to come out of the penalty period, then, uh, then someone can protect not only their liquid assets, but also their house. And so that's a, a personal choice and people make that choice every day. You know, again, we run the numbers and give them the options and see what they wanna do. A situation where you have a couple and if, if you folks are married and you have someone you're married to who's not healthy or you're having your own health concern, maybe thinking, okay, if one of us passes away sooner than the other, then would the other one, because they've already embarked on all this planning that we've been talking about this past uh, 50 minutes. Um, so our clients, Chuck and Arlene, they came and they said, okay, Chuck's health, he's got some cardiac stuff, Arlene's struggling to keep her diabetes in tow. Um, what if one of them passes away before the other? We've embarked on this planning. And then unfortunately, the one that you thought was going to be sicker wasn't. So will the one who's remaining alive have a harder time protecting the assets that are left? So mm -hmm. how do we do this? How do we organize this? Couple of scenarios. So let's say we're talking about a, a, a married couple and um, they're taking advantage of the spousal protections. So the healthy spouse has exempted the house and $130,000 and has protected only the excess. So she's gotten her husband on Medicaid. That's fine. Everything is okay for the time being. But then uh, if the husband dies first and, and then she needs long-term care, well, then she's starting over protecting the house and the 130,000. So there again, some spouses will choose to throw the long ball They'll take a long-term view and say, well, I can get by without Medicaid for my husband for some time. So I'm, again, going to include the exempt assets into my planning, even though it'll delay my husband's Medicaid, um, it'll be worth it in the long run because it'll also protect those additional assets if I need long-term care. And so some people will go that route. For other people where the need is really harsh and really immediate, they'll just take the short-term view and do whatever they can to qualify the husband for Medicaid ASAP. Second scenario is, regardless of whatever a couple has done to protect assets and qualify the one spouse, let's say it's the husband, um, what then happens if the wife somehow predeceases the husband? So, you know, in planning mode, all eyes are on dad because he's the one who's He's kind of in rough shape. He has a lot of needs. Um, mom's doing okay. So they protect assets by putting everything in mom's name and doing some of the things we've talked about. But then out of nowhere, mom has a medical event and she predeceases dad. Well, what happens to all the assets we've protected? Well, if the house is owned jointly, boom, it's his. And if he's in a nursing home because mom's no longer there to take care of him, then the house is now exposed. And the other assets, if they're jointly held, they're his also, and they have to be protected all over again. 
except now we don't have the spousal protections at our um, fingertips. Or even if the assets are in her name solely and her will leaves everything to him, same thing, everything goes flooding back over to his column and we have to start over. So what do you do? The standard thing that most couples do in this situation, which is not the least bit pleasant, is they put all the assets in the name of the healthy spouse, in this case, the wife, and she writes a new will disinheriting her own husband. If he's at home and he can be managed at home, then usually she'll leave everything in a trust for him so that the kids manage the money and they dish it out for whatever he needs, but they withhold it from anything that Medicaid would pay for. Funds are available for dad and they have to be used for him to the extent that are needed, but again, withheld from whatever Medicaid would pay for. Or if dad's in a nursing home, then maybe mom would leave everything directly to the kids under the theory that dad's not gonna need anything. And so the kids might as well enjoy it. They have kids to put through college or whatever. Uh, but the point is mom has the choice and either way she can protect the assets from having to uh, be protected all over again. So there are options there, yep. which are unfortunate. We uh, hope that we have some veterans in our crowd and we appreciate your service or you are married to a veteran. And we would just like to spend about a minute discussing mm -hmm. the amazing program called VA aid in attendance that a lot of people are not aware of and it produces income in ways that are very powerful and very dramatic and enables somebody to afford a lot more home care and stay in their home than if they didn't have it or an assisted living. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you just want to mention quickly? Sure. About uh, this program? Yeah, th th this, this program provides monthly income. It can be up to around 1900 for a veteran or 2300 for a couple or 1200 for a surviving spouse uh, to any uh, veteran or surviving spouse who needs assistance with his or her ADLs. If uh, the veteran served during wartime and was discharged other than dishonorably, and if the, the veteran or the surviving spouse currently needs uh, assistance, um, and then uh, that person can qualify financially there's an asset test and a limit and an income limit. Um, and there's a transfer of asset look back period. So the important point is that if you take everything we just talked about for Medicaid, you can import a lot of that into the VA analysis to accelerate eligibility for that program as well. Now, in certain ways, there are tensions between the two programs where qualifying for one will prevent you from qualifying for the other. It's a little bit like whack-a-mole where you solve one problem and then something else pops up. And so we try to uh, develop a plan that provides the greatest uh, combined benefit so that we null out the, uh, the moles and, and get the, the, uh, the best combined result. So one thing we wanted to mention, and it's not specific to applying to Medicaid or VA uh, benefits, but it is an, an additional factor to consider especially we're in a tax season right now. Um, and hopefully you'll enjoy that little extra time if you need it till May 17. Um, but we like to mention this because it's something that a lot of folks don't even think about. So our client, Tim, he was a senior citizen and he had insufficient income to really fully utilize the cost of de deducting his cost of care. He had been getting home care. And so the combination of him having a lower income because he was retired and it being primarily social security and a small pension and him having costs of care to deduct as a medical expense. What was the option for Tim? And many of you may be in the midst of this kind of uh, thinking. So here we have a little fun with the internal revenue code, which we love to do. Uh, and, and this has to do with the medical expense deduction for uh, long-term care. Now think of the flow of money. If, if Tim established the irrevocable trust like we talked about, and he put a certain amount of money into it and triggered a, a penalty period of a certain duration, or even if he had so much money that he's really gonna have to wait out the entire five year look back period, uh, then periodically there's gonna be money coming back to him from the trust, well, bouncing off the kids and then coming back to him. 
and then he's going to pay for his home care or his assisted living uh, and get that big medical expense deduction. But let's say that his income is uh, too low to really en enjoy that huge medical expense deduction, which could be $100,000 a year or more. Um, what do you do? Do you just, well, you could. The alternative though would be as you have money that went into the trust, which has to come out of the trust and bounce off one of the kids before it goes back to Tim. Well, what if the kids, instead of giving the money back to Tim for Tim to pay the facility or the home care agency, what if the son paid it directly? Well, now if the son is paying for more than 50% of Tim's total support, then the son can claim Tim as a dependent on his 1040 and deduct all of Tim's deductible medical expenses plus his own family's to the extent they exceed 10% of his adjusted gross income. So if the son has adjusted gross income of $150,000 a year, for example, 10% of that is 15 grand. And if the deduction is 100 grand, well, then the son can deduct 85 grand on his 1040, which is going to put about 25 grand back in his pocket. And if he does that for two or three years, then there's just some real money that's being produced there at no expense to anyone in the family. That additional money can be given back to Tim to help him pay for additional months each year of home care or assisted living to again, forestall the date on which his assets run out and he then is financially forced into a nursing home. So this is just another source of leverage of Tim's own money um, and, and, and this, can, this can add something like 25% to the time period in question. Because if there's 25 grand a year being produced over and above what anybody was expecting, well, that money can be used to pay for an additional three months of home care or assisted living every year that, uh, that this game is on. And so that really kicks the can pretty far down the road over and above the benefit of all the strategies that we've talked about so far. So wherever we can, we're doing layer upon layer upon layer. Each one is providing a benefit and the combined result is we think as good as it can be to help you uh, sustain the lifestyle that you prefer. And you can see it's all, you know, a large piece of a puzzle that you have to put with the other of how is there a way to find a funding source for care that you might need? How do you um, add income through either VA aid in attendance, um, perhaps through this whole tax strategy that Tom mm -hmm. had mentioned that if you're paying for care and you're not able to fully utilize that medical expense deduction that one of your children or someone close to you can and be able to give you that money back in the form of compensating what it is you need <coughs> And so so what, we're, what, we're doing is, what we're doing is taking this brutally complicated body of regulations with all of these specific numbers uh, in it, and, and instead of using each of them individually, we're combining them in ways uh, that provide the, the greatest uh, combined result. Right, and as you can see, you, you all have your own life story, you have your own life circumstances, whether it's your you are the one living in a child's home or you're caring for a parent and you satisfy an exception, which people are very thrilled to find out about mm -hmm. uh, early on in the process, or you're in planning mode and you're putting uh, funds in a trust or you are spending it down on ways so that you qualify. These are all ways in which you can embark and they are very individualized and they are very personal. And, uh, you know, one size doesn't fit all, which is why we've just spent the past hour where I'm sure most of you are feeling a bit overstimulated by all the information, but it really can work based on your circumstances. One size that does fit all, we put some notes in here at the end about different uh, legal documents that can, that can be very important in this type of planning. Uh, read especially the section on powers of attorney. Um, everything that we've just talked about can end up requiring a power of attorney if you become unable to manage your affairs. If any of these strategies are going to be implemented, 
then a family member would have to be authorized under power of attorney to do them. And uh, the, the thing about powers of attorney is that they only allow what they say they allow, uh, and they're not all created equal. So just because someone has a power of attorney doesn't mean that the authority was granted to uh, engage in transfer of asset planning or establishing trusts, moving assets around from husband to wife or from the couple to a trust or from the couple to, to an irrevocable annuity or, or any of the things we've talked about. Those powers have to be very specifically stated in the power of attorney or they do not exist. And if they do not exist, then off we go to probate court to have a conservator appointed and take our uh, chances with the judge to get these things done. Usually that works, but it's not fun and we can't guarantee the result. Whole lot easier, a whole lot less expensive to make sure you have a power of attorney that is prepared very, very specifically with this type of planning in mind, at least in terms of enabling it. Not, not, not in the sense that, that when you sign a power of attorney, you're gonna actually be doing these things. All it means is that you retain the ability to do these things uh, if you're not able to, to do them yourself uh, some, some years. And it, protects, and it protects privacy and right. spending extra costs and having to pursue any right. legal action in the probate court. So mm -hmm. at this point, uh, we uh, would encourage any of you folks who have questions, if you wanna open up um, your sound so that we can uh, see you and hear you, that would be great. Hi, uh, yes, I have a um, question. When does a, a gift say to a child, um, when is it just a gift and when does it turn into an asset tr transfer? There's no distinction between the two. Any movement of anything of value from one person to another is either compensation or a gift. It must be one or the other. There's, there's no third category. So if you're handing $1,000 to somebody because he earned it, well, then it's compensation, then it's income. But if you're handing $1,000 to someone who didn't earn it, it's, it's a gift, it's a, it's a transfer, it, it, it's, it's a gift for tax purposes, you know, if it rises to that level. Uh, but it's always a transfer for Medicaid purposes if it wasn't earned. Anyone else? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> okay, I, I welcome. Gone. Uh, we're New Yorkers, you're in Connecticut. How much of what you've said is state specific? Um, most of what we've just said is federal. Uh, a lot of the numbers change from state to state, but by and large, the planning that the range of planning strategies does not change state to state. New York also has what's called spousal refusal. One spouse can refuse in writing to provide for the care of the other spouse. Oh, that'd spouse, be fun. Yeah, <laughs> if, if the other spouse assigns- That's a great his or her, Thanksgiving dinner there. Yeah, if the other spouse assigns his or her support rights to the state. Uh, and, and also in New York, if we're gonna do a a trust and uh, annuity a com combination approach, we would instead do a trust and promissory note approach. Uh, so, so there are some differences in how these things get executed, but, but the fundamentals of what we've talked about applies um, to a very, very large extent. Okay, that's what I thought, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. I and we, and we, have a, we have a steady stream of New York clients as well, just because we're so close to the border. Right. I'm licensed in New York, but as long as we do our work from Connecticut, we can represent anybody anywhere. Oh, oh okay, good. Thank you. Well, we, we wish you a, a good a good lunchtime together. <laughs> can, you, can you list two family members as power of attorney? And, and what is the difference between durable and power of attorney? Durable power of attorney? 
Okay, yep, those are great questions. So we actually encourage you to choose somebody who you trust and you can do it in a number of ways. If you have a couple of people that you trust, then we encourage you to do that and be enable them to, to act in a way that would enable them to not have to necessarily act together. So that way, if they're in different locations, one could help you or they both could help you, but that's up to you if you wanted to do it where both had to be in agreement or not. We also encourage people to have somebody that can act as a successor on that power of attorney because life does happen. And sometimes you think someone who is available and can, we like to have somebody that's available in the event that the people or person that you name is also available. Um, this helps you avoid having to go to probate court to have someone appointed as your conservator and a power of attorney is so much easier. And in fact, when a power of attorney is done, the law in Connecticut is that the probate court must look at that power of attorney. So we really rely on a power of attorney in a very strong way now. And it's something that you can do very easily. And then the other question you asked was about it being durable. Well, there's different ways that you can have a power of attorney. You can have it existing right as soon as you execute it, that the formalization required of having it signed and notarized and witnessed and that sort of thing. It can last through uh, what we call incompetence or incapacity, and that's what creates the durability of that power of attorney. Some people also do a thing called a springing power of attorney where they want an event to happen like proof from a doctor that you are incapable or incompetent and then that's going to be able to be functioning in that in that document for usability. Um, so it's all an individualized situation, but we do encourage everyone to have one and not take a form off the internet so that it's specific to what it is you want, like Tom said, so that it names who you want and for the person to be able to do what you want in the event of something changing in your health and what have you. And then the other part is that you should also have a healthcare representative and a living will, because what a power of attorney is not, is it does not have anything to do with health and housing and things like that. It's a financial document that involves decision-making regarding your finances. And so often we have people confuse them and I've acted as a fiduciary where I've had doctors even call me and say, oh, you're the power of attorney. And I say, why is that relevant if you're asking me about a health issue for, the, for your patient? So a full package should have the power of attorney, healthcare representative, and living will. Because a living will is only a piece of paper that has a limited set of circumstances versus the healthcare agent is a person that's named to be able to interface with your medical provider about what and how and when should treatment and therapies occur if needed. So hopefully that answered your question and more. Yes, yes, thank you. My mother, uh, before passing, uh, well, before uh, years ago, she had all of the paperwork you're saying, but she had medical surrogate, as you were referring to medical, where she Health had her, right. right? She had her uh, husband, then he passed, my older brother, myself, and my sister. When she was living, the uh, for um, her husband was on a ventilator. The doctor was encouraging, not encouraging. He was looking to recess it, to uh, keep him living. The nurses felt different. She had to go back to the lawyer to get her husband's wishes um, put into place, but it didn't happen. So they rehabbed him. And he did continue for six months, but went through a lot. So how does somebody protect themselves? You think you have this, you know, medical surrogate, or as you had said, representative through your lawyers, who has the authority, if in a case like that, a doctor or the system? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, the way, the way it should work is if you have, if you yourself, for example, since you use the example of your mom, but you had, uh, you have a certain wish that you don't want something to happen to you in a certain event, or you do, the combination of the living will, which is only utilized in very limited situations, would be looked at and decided if that document applied to the circumstances. And if it doesn't, 
then the healthcare representative would have the authority to be helping make the decision with the doctors because there are issues like do not resuscitate. That's a medical determination. That's an order that a doctor makes based on someone's health and ability to recover. So right. you have a do not resuscitate with a living will and a healthcare representative. It's really a team that has to look at it. And depending on the set of circumstances, if it applies under the living will, the whole idea of the living will is that it's the guidance of the person, the patient, who would need to be their right, their, their um, needs and wishes honored. And so, you know, I'm sure there were, there were different sets of circumstances and, and what have you, I, I don't know, you know, what sure. your mom, but in order to safeguard, because it sounds like the question is, how do I safeguard what I want? The best way to do that is to be very specific in a living will, but realize that a living will is a very limited document. And that's why the healthcare representative is important and that you share your wishes verbally and in writing so that you can be the advocate. So someone for you could be the advocate of your wishes so that you're not prolonged in life in a circumstance you didn't want to be. And so right. documents, nothing's foolproof, but those documents are there to en enforce and enable a person to have the comfort that they know that they will not be uh, treated in a way that they didn't want, unless there's other factors. And that's, that's I understand. Thank you. They had both paperwork. They did it jointly. So mm -hmm. they felt they had everything covered, not knowing what their future health issues would be. But again, everything, you know. Right. Well, I think if you can be as specific as possible in your documents and um, that can be done, then it, at least uh, it can't 100% guarantee that there's not going to be some kind of or, you know, interaction, but it will at least enable an opportunity for the, your wishes to be uh, imposed. And Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Um, I, I have a question about um, IRAs and uh, how, how does Medicaid consider IRAs? Are they um, within their grasp or not? <laughs> They are. There is nothing categorically exempt or protected about any form of retirement asset mm -hmm. or cash on the table. And for that reason, they can require some uh, specific planning. Uh, sometimes what a person will do is irrevocably annuitize the IRA, or if there's a 401k, roll it over into an IRA and then annuitize it so that uh, you are taking it off the table as an asset, you're converting it into income. So you got to look at your total income to see if anything needs to mm -hmm. be there. Uh, but you are doing it in a way that does not require cashing it out lump sum. So if you have an annuity with an extended term, it might uh, pay out a little faster than just your annual re uh, minimum required distribution. Mm -hmm. But it'll be close enough that you'll probably keep yourself in the same tax bracket. Um, uh, and some people, you know, depending on their age and their diagnosis, uh, if, if someone really thinks that they're going to need long-term care, uh, whether it be soon or not so soon, then sometimes people will over withdraw from their IRA every year, uh, whatever amount they can without jumping into the next tax bracket and then taking that excess paying the tax, because they're gonna pay tax on it someday anyway. You're, you're not gonna avoid taxation. It's just a matter of not jumping into a higher bracket. So they'll take that additional sum and they'll sock it into the irrevocable trust. So maybe they establish a trust today and they put their house in it. Um, and then each year they put in some amount of money from IRA withdrawals so that over time, the total amount protected has really accumulated. And by the way, why would someone put a house into a trust if the house is an exempt asset? And the answer is because as we saw, there are circumstances in which it can become a very much non-exempt asset. Mm -hmm. If it never did, even if it always stayed exempt, um, maybe someone is more comfortable putting the house into a trust than their other financial accounts into a trust, or, or maybe their IRAs and they really don't want to take the tax hit in the short term. So to put the house in the trust instead, and they figure, well, if I ever need long-term care, then I can liquidate those accounts and buy the house back from the trust. 
a little, yeah, a, like little one, a little one two punch. Mm -hmm. So so you're putting the value of the house in the trust, letting the time pass on that, which works to your advantage. And then if you need long term care and you're still holding too much money, you can zero out with what you're holding by repurchasing an asset that at that time is still exempt. Bingo, you're yeah. eligible for Medicaid without having spent a penny. And that's why it's very individualized. And sort of to add to, sometimes what we've seen too is if somebody has a, a higher cost of care, then at the end of one year, they'll liquidate the IRA because they have the offsetting medical expenses. Yeah, if you're in a penalty period and you're paying for your own care, man, is that a good right. time to be liquidating? You'll do a December withdrawal because you have your 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 assets um, that you, you have your tax uh, uh, costs er eradicated and erased because you have your medical expenses right. and then you do it in January of the new year because you also have the expenses. So it, there's, there's so many ways that you can, but unfortunately that retirement plan is on the table. <laughs> if, if, you put, if, thank you. if you put the house in a trust, um, if you still have a mortgage on it, uh, I guess I what I was wondering, uh, in, in a lot of cases, we have the opportunity for uh, tax credits on uh, on our uh, on our pro property tax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like mm -hmm. your tax relief, depending upon income and. Uh, yes. Um, so if you put it in a trust, do you now have to pay normal taxes on that house? Does so, that take away your benefit? A couple of issues there. One, if you have a mortgage on the property, then if you transfer title into an irrevocable trust, then you run the risk that the lender will call the loan. Okay. And you should only do that in a case where if they call the loan, uh, you'd be comfortable paying off the mortgage. And, and some people are, and that's fine. Um, but if not, then, then, then you might want to wait a while. Um, uh, and with regard to property taxes, we always leave you with a reserved life use in the deed so that it doesn't negatively impact your town property tax credits. So what you, is that called? So as, as, as the title holder of the life use, you are still legally responsible for paying the taxes, which is actually beneficial because that means you're entitled to whatever tax credits you get. It also means that you can pay the tax rather than your kids paying the tax and deduct it on your 1040 to the extent it's deductible. Right. Yeah. Right. And then not lose out on the tax relief that you had mentioned. Right. Question. You had, you had talked about um, uh, the, the cost for a nursing home today vis-a-vis uh, -vis what it might be five, 10 years from now, whatever. Um, do, does the cost um, for a nursing home uh, increase significantly once you are their client? Oh, it, it, you pay rack rate. Uh, on any given date, it doesn't matter how long you've been there. Right, like there's so whatever their published rate is. If it's five hundred bucks a day today, that's if you move in today or or ten years prior. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, that that in, that inflation will work against you every time. And the rate <laughs> now is about fourteen to sixteen thousand dollars a month as an average yeah. nursing home rate. Yeah, figure five hundred a day. I mean, that's for real. Right, assisted living can run anywhere from seven or eight on over 10 or 11, depending upon your care needs. Yeah. Care up to live in. Five, five to nine. Yeah. Thousand. Depending on what you need. Yeah. So, so home care is, kind of, it is less expensive. And the, if you start to need more than about eight hours of care at home, mm -hmm. it really would make sense to be having mm -hmm. a live in because that is much less expensive. But some people just can't have a live in for a variety of reasons. They don't have the suitable accommodations, they're not comfortable with that, or they have nighttime needs and they move to 12 hour shift. So that's when it gets expensive. Yeah. So. It used to be that estate taxes were the biggest issue in estate planning <laughs> because they were brutally expensive and they affected a lot of people because of the low thresholds. But now that tax affects very few people because of high thresholds and long-term care has taken its place as the great evil out there because it is ruinously expensive. Mm -hmm. the, um, the desire among people to protect themselves against it has exploded. Thank you. Do you feel that there's any benefit to long-term care insurance when you could do all these other, um, you know, uh, 
when when you could do with some of the things that you're talking about? Very interesting question. Uh, yes, uh, because it can change the numbers. You know, someone with a long-term care policy, even if it has a modest daily benefit, that can change some of the ratios that we calculate in certain types of applications of these rules. Um, so it can enhance the result. Um, but, but several clients have made the point to us that it's very interesting that for the, for the price of, of a one-year premium on any decent long-term care insurance policy, that they could instead have the irrevocable trust, which doesn't need to be renewed every year. You pay for it once and you're done. Uh, if you have a long-term care policy that's, that's worth anything at all, you're, you're paying um, a pretty decent premium for one year's coverage. And then you're either gonna pay it again every year after that, or you're gonna lose the coverage. Whereas with the trust, you set it up, you feed it whatever you want over time, <clears throat> and then you've got it. Um, Yes, we do encourage people to look seriously at long-term care insurance. This type of planning is done to enhance that coverage because very few people have enough long-term care insurance to really protect all of their assets. I mean, to really protect all of your assets, you would need a policy with a daily benefit that covers the full cost of a, of a day's long-term care with a lifetime benefit period. Now, how many people have that? Right, those, those programs actually oh. existed yeah, there's there's we have clients who so, got them 20 years ago or 10 years ago, but not so much now. So even if your policy gives you so much protection per day or for two years or whatever it is, that still leaves you exposed in the margins for anything you need beyond that. And and, and that puts your entire life savings once again, very much right on the table. So these other strategies, whether you have a policy or not, can take those assets off the table in a way like nothing else. But that is one reason we do encourage people to consider it because even some small amount of long-term care insurance can help. And then and some folks don't have large amounts of assets to save. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a coverage, even a hundred dollars a day or what have you, um, and there's some other factors that go with long-term care insurance. If you are looking at long-term care insurance, make sure you're looking at what's called a partnership plan because that is an asset protection as well. Um, uh, but to the extent of the policies value. Right. So for example, a $400,000 coverage for your program, your policy, then you would, when you would also be able to put away that amount of your assets. And that's why it's called a partnership yeah. asset protection part of a policy. So it's something that would be important to look for if you're looking at a long-term care insurance situation. But a lot of people can't qualify for health reasons, pre-existing conditions, and, um, and the, the expense. So great question. It is something we do talk with people and we do see people, see people who are very excited to have long-term care insurance and it's helped a lot protect uh, the assets that are existing to get through a penalty period and that sort of thing. Yeah. So very, very helpful. Great question. Thank you. I have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think this will be our last question because we've gone over by about 40 minutes and Tom and Michelle have been so generous with their oh, Thank you. Well, I guess we'll just have to thank run. you. So one more, one more and Miranda the last hungry. question. Okay, well, um, I'm speaking on behalf of my mother, um, who's going to be 70 this year. Um, she's cognitively declining, and the doctors suspect that she might have early onset dementia. Um, we have a, a home, well, she owns a home where we're paying the mortgage, and we live with her to take care of her. So, I mean, her goal is to pass on the house to myself and my sister. Um, and I guess my question is, how can we protect her, her assets and what option would be beneficial for us in terms of like gifts? And you mentioned um, like a revo irrevocable trust or should we transfer the title of the house to us now, I guess. Is, well, that, is that type of scenario brings the entire analysis that we've just gone through right on the table uh, because if she's gonna need long-term care, then first of all, you have potentially the caregiver child exception available to you over time. Um, but, but with or without it, her cost of care is going to increase. And uh, that means that her life savings is exposed. And God forbid, if she enters a nursing home, uh, then the value of the house would be exposed or, or even not 
then upon her death, it would be exposed through probate recovery. So yeah, she might be very interested in getting that house into an irrevocable trust um, immediately, uh, potentially along with other assets as well, and maybe applying for Medicaid immediately to trigger that penalty period so that, uh, that the transfer doesn't affect her for the full five years. So this, this could be an example of planning that needs to be uh, done uh, kind of in, in a very complete way, very immediately, because um, you need the whole plan put in place in order to be able to shorten that, that time period uh, before she qualifies for Medicaid. Right. Even she has Medicare, so she couldn't qualify for Medicaid as well? That's right. Totally different. Okay. Her, okay. Her, her, I know the difference. I didn't know she can be yeah. qualified for Medicaid. Well, yeah, she her, might her not asset, be now. Her care, okay. her care is private pay until she becomes financially eligible for Medicaid, which is what triggers everything that we've been uh, discussing. Right. So okay. She, and time is of the essence in her situation right. because yeah. if she's cognitively able to even get a power of attorney taken care of, that can, mm -hmm. then the rest of the planning can be done through that power of attorney as long as that power of attorney is very specific. Right, but if you wait until she's not really competent to sign a power of attorney, then she won't be able to do any of what we're talking about. Yeah. And you won't be able to do it for her either. Unless you go to the probate court and that's uh, not a set thing. Yeah, yeah. So. Cheaper and easier to do the power of attorney while she's still capable of, of doing one and then you can use it to trigger the whole plan. That's what I think. Yeah, so I'm researching everything now because yes, I understand exactly. that. <laughs> the time is important. Part. That's right. Sorry <laughs> yeah. Going under these circumstances, what I can say though, is mm -hmm. we found, and I think you will find this too, that you can't necessarily reverse the situation that you're going through with your mom and your family. And I'm sorry to hear the circumstances. This, these are tough times, um, but there are certain things that you can take control of and that's what enables you to feel not so powerless and hopeless because if there are certain things that are important to your mom and your family then especially if you and your sister are in the home and assisting in her care then that is something that you can take the plan and do to what it is that your mom's wishes would be versus having the system just let it go so you know yeah, exactly. you're unfortunate but you know, gaining more information, you joining us today and starting to look into what the options are is the first step and we wish you the best. And I know that Goldstone will be able to offer you too the support to be able to get through what's ahead. So we wish Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. She can still control her financial destiny. And that really is the overall point. The state of Connecticut might like to be able to control your, fi your financial destiny but you, you have enough tools at your disposal that you can control it. Right. Could, all about. could, I, could I just ask quick, um, as lawyers, do you have um, a flat legal fee for uh, writing up the proper paperwork uh, with your clients or is it an hourly fee? How does that work? What we do is we start with a, a, an initial consultation, which during COVID we're doing remotely. Um, and we charge for that on an hourly basis. And that usually is about an hour. And usually by the end of that, we can define a course of action that needs to be taken, which we then quote on a flat fee basis so that you know in advance what's gonna be involved, what it's gonna, and more importantly, what it's gonna produce. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you all. We wish you good health. We wish you a beautiful day. And for those of you who have registered. We'll look forward to seeing you in two weeks talking about uh, trusts and how they can protect mm -hmm. yourself um, and your interests and needs. Some of the things we talked about today, we'll get into a little bit more depth in, in that topic. And if you haven't registered, we encourage you to do so. Um, and thank you very much for spending almost quite a bit of time today, oh, an hour and a three quarters. So thank you so much. And thank you again to Miranda and Lynn. Oh, Tom and Michelle, thank you for everything. You've been generous with your time. You've been generous with all of your knowledge. Um, I am really, I'm excited. And everyone's questions were so wonderful. Um, so thank you for this wonderful program. As you mentioned, April 21st at 12 o'clock, you're going to be presenting again. 
um, on protect yourself with trusts, how to protect assets, avoid probate, and maintain control. I'm gonna resend the flyer out that has the link on it so that those who didn't sign up certainly have the ability to sign up for next time. Sounds um, great. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you.